Welcome back. The beat goes on for politicians, but NECA insists on playing a tune for that particular musical. And so we've got, as you've seen there, Adewale Oyerinde, who is the Director General of the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA. Good morning. Thank you for coming Good morning. today. Good morning. A quite interesting scenario um, at this point in time because we've got quite some time uh, before Nigerians go out there to cast their ballots. Yeah, so they could make up their mind, they could see different things, different scenarios yeah. play out. So much as they are talking about what they want to do, how or why they think Nigerians should vote for them, but you, uh, Naka, even the OPS, also looking through their document, uh, you've seen a thing or two about the economy, uh, some of which, from what we understand, not exactly, uh, you're not exactly phased or happy entirely yeah. with what you've seen. Tell us about it. Thank you for having me once again. I think from our perspective, you know, not um, focusing on the politics of it, but strictly on the economy of it, and how we are afraid to organize businesses as a whole. I think for us, um, there are key fundamental issues. We feel we can't be complaining about the effects while we are feeding the cost. So let's look at the fundamental issues that drive the economy and has brought us significantly to where we are currently. You know, we've mentioned the issue of the oil theft, we've mentioned the issue of the refineries that has ballooned, the issue of subsidy to over six trillion. The government has proposed that it's going to stop subsidy by June next year. How that, how that is going to happen, we haven't been told. There's no definitive roadmap in dealing with that. There are also issues concerning the business environment, as it were. You know, the regulatory incursions into businesses, the legislative issues, <coughs> excuse me, the legislative issues that we have also. And then the whole big issue of, of, um, of, of forex and energy cost. So for us, those are the conversations that we want to have. Not the generic, um, I will do this, I will do that, but what are the roadmaps, definitive roadmaps, that the business community can hold the candidates to, that Nigerians can hold the candidates to. That you say you will do this, and you haven't done it. No, enough of rhetorics, enough of, enough of the same stories that we have had. But we want a definitive roadmap on how exactly we are going to deal with those issues. I, I, I will rephrase, I will reiterate what I said earlier. No, we can't be complaining about the cause, or we can't be complaining about the effects, and then we keep feeding the cost. Mm. So I'm wondering, I mean, for you at NECA, what, are some of, what is high on your priority list? Uh, if you were to be looking at any of the candidates, uh, what, would, what would any of them say that you would say, this is the person we think really has the plan? One of the things, they say, our focus is the economy, basically. Mm -hmm. you, know, you fix the economy, you fixed, you will have fixed many of the problems that we're having. Yeah, and the economy, there are many yeah. aspects yeah. of the economy. You've just pointed at subsidy, if you talk about electricity, yeah. uh, the aspect of uh, the regulatory environment, etc. cetera. Uh, but for you, uh, on the priority list, because there are a lot of things, and yeah. you can only do one, perhaps one at a time, Absolutely. or if you're going to focus on a number of them, but prioritizing one of them, which one would you say is the most important to you? I think you fix, um, let me give you three priorities, mm -hmm. and they rate on the same level. Let's fix power, and then let's fix the issue of forex, and then let's fix the issue of insecurity, because those three they are at the heart of, of industrialization. Without power, you cannot industrialize, and majority of our businesses they run they, they, they run on power. They need power to, to run, and if you look at the trend within the context of diesel in the last one year, and many businesses budgeted them. 250, 300 for diesel per liter in January. And as today is running to over 700, it disrupts business plan. Then let's look at the issue of insecurity. There's massive dis the industrialization in the north, which has made many businesses to close down in the north. And it's trickling down gradually to, to the south. And then the third one is the issue of, issue of forex, as I mentioned. Many businesses need forex. They need inputs, especially those inputs that you have to import. Without forex, you cannot produce, your capacity utilization will be less, you cannot expand, you cannot employ. So it has far-reaching consequences for organized business. So those three components, let's fix power, let's fix insecurity, and then let's fix the issue of forex. Let's take the issue of power. What have the engagement in the, with the power sector been like uh, for your organization? Because we know that a significant part of the power sector has been privatized. There have been, you know, um, let's say, um, goals, um, you know, 
earmarked for, yeah. for meeting and, and they have not been able to meet this goal, so to speak, uh, with regards to generation, with regards to distribution. Yeah. Transmission is the only part still in the hands of, of government. Yeah. So what exactly has the engagement been like uh, for your um, organization with the power, with the power minister or the power sector in general? Well, we are of the discos, we call them discos, distribution companies are also members of NECA and I can tell you engagement is ongoing, has continued for a long time. And we can't close our eyes to the challenges that the discos also are facing. They have issues with energy theft. They have issues with, um, with their own internal structures. They have issues also with government owing them billions and billions of naira. So you, you cannot, we can't deal with the disco as one entity. You know, we have to look at the whole value chain of the power sector. You mentioned the, the generating companies. You know, the, the gen discos, we say the Jenkos are not, are, not, um, are, not, are not generating enough for them to distribute. The Jenkos, we say the distribution lines of the discos is not sufficient enough to take what, what they have to, what they have generated. So we have to look at the whole value chain of the power sector before we start identifying what are the critical issues that we need to solve now. What are the critical issues within that value chain that we need to solve in three months, in six months, in nine months, in one year? Mm. That it, we have not done really. It's interesting that, you know, members of uh, the discos, I mean, the owners of the disco or the discos are members of your own organization yeah, as well. Are, so yeah. I want to imagine that they also understand the pains uh, that you go through and that Absolutely. they would have an engagement to see how they could be creative in terms of, you know, solving some of the problems that you face. I mean, we've, we've heard of... Uh, you know, providing electricity in clusters, etc. Absolutely. But uh, while you can speak to that, yeah. what I really want you to talk about is this issue of subsidy. Uh, you've talked about how subsidy is now ballooning into the trillions of naira. Yeah. We have, have it in the budget. We know as a people and as a country that that is unsustainable. It is. However, we've seen the effect of what deregulating a sector can yeah. do to it. Uh, with the instance with diesel, um, how you know diesel was selling for roughly 250, and before the end of the year, it's already almost at 800 naira per liter. Do you think it's something that we can afford to do with petrol? Now, why why are we why did we arrive at subsidy of of a trillion in the first place? Let's leave the six trillion out of it. Why did we arrive at subsidy of of 500 billion in the first place? Basically, the foundation is you can't, you are not refining, and because you are not refining, you are importing. So what ordinarily should have been a blessing is now becoming a cost, because the higher the value of crude in the international market, the higher the amount you spend on them you spend on importing. So the first point for us is, is to go back to the reasons why the four refineries are not working. We've had turnaround maintenances over time, for refineries in a country as big as ours, probably the only country in OPEC that is not refining sufficiently. There are fundamental issues that even critical stakeholders are shying away from. Why four refineries not working? It is unacceptable. If you deal with the issue of four refineries, it brings down the quantity and the quantum of, um, of, of fuel that will be important. And let's look at the other issue, the, the controversy concerning the subsidy itself. We have high-ranking officials even in government that have come to question the quantity of petrol that another agency of government say we are consuming on a daily basis. So those are issues that we need to deal with, and we need to deal with decisively. Whoever is coming in as the next government have to deal with it frontally, have to have the political will to address those issues, because those are the issues at the heart of the problems. Are, are you saying that, are you suggesting that we keep the, the, the subsidies of petrol, but look for how to bring down the cost of the subsidies. Is that what you're saying? We, our, our position is to remove subsidy. Remove subsidy while you deal with the issue of the four refineries. Let's deal with it. If you make the four refineries functional, then we will have no business um, importing. And that will crash the issue of subsidy totally. And come to think of it also, the controversy around the scam, some have called it a scam, some have called it organized crime, the subsidy regime. So when key officials in the OPS and key officials of government are also saying that, then it calls for a deep reflection, deep. Some have called it an inquiry, you know, make, put up a judicial inquiry to deal with those issues. Few years ago, I think the government then 
came up with a, a budget to look at the issue of subsidy. I think uh, one of the bank chiefs was, was the leader of that, of, that, of that committee. And they came up with far-reaching recommendations. We don't know what happened with those recommendations. So we believe strongly that we should do it with subsidy. It is unsustainable. It is a drain in Nigeria's um, revenue. It is, um, it is very few people are benefiting from it, not the whole of Nigerians. But before you deal with the issue of subsidy, let's address the low-hanging fruit. And the low-hanging fruit is fixing the four refineries. We can do it. If you could just take a look at some of the highlights of their manifestos. For instance, that of the APC candidate, uh, the economy, some of what he talks about, he, he talks about tax reform. He wants to review corporate tax system, deploy technology, and effective policies to better rationalize the system. He wants to review federal budgetary methodology, build economy that will produce more for everybody, both for agriculture and manufactured goods, improve existing industries. And then uh, he talks about adjusting uh, allocation of revenue between the federal and state governments. Do any of this, how did they come across to you? Beautiful manifesto. But uh, let, let me speak to the tax, to the tax reforms. Because currently we say, and rightly so, you know, organized businesses pay up to um, over 50 taxes, levies, and fees across the three, three um, tiers of government, both legal and illegal. And hardly will you find a business that can survive paying over 50 different taxes. So it would be interesting to see the details, you know, the details of the operationalization of that, of, that, of that item in the manifesto. Because we believe rather than overtax, rather than burdening businesses with more taxes, I think expanding the tax net would be a sustainable option. I think I've heard him say that, that they should bring in more people to the tax net. Absolutely. Supported. But the current tax regime, you know, the current tax regime is burdensome to organize businesses and it has the potential to also stop investors from coming to this country. And we need investors as it were. And this is in spite of the fact that we hear a lot of talk around because you speak with state governors, they acknowledge that this is a problem. Mm -hmm. A number of state governors say, you know, what we've done is we've been able to harmonize um, our tax um, regime in such a way that you only have one office for for tax, for tax businesses, and that, you know, it is that office that collects for both the state and the local government and remits afterwards to, you know, what is the local government yeah. and what is the state government. Your members have not reported any such state which, which have been successful in that regard? You know, the, the, so some call it official statements and, and the reality on the ground. And we've had to engage one or two governors also and also show them evidences that, look, these are the taxes that businesses pay and these are recepted, recepted levies that our members are also forced to pay. And those levies, those, those receipts, they seem strange to those, to those, to those governor, governor, government officials. How is this happening within the context of the environment? So the reality on ground is businesses are paying far much more than they, could, they should ordinarily pay within the context of what they face. Okay, if I can then jump to, pardon me, that of the... Uh, the PDP, well, he said that they've got uh, what, three basic principles. Uh, first is to reaffirm the importance of the private sector leadership and greater private sector participation and development, break the federal government's monopoly for all infrastructure, the sectors uh, including refineries, rail transportation, and power transmission. And then he wants to allow the markets, you know, to have an the market just to play a huge role in terms of deregulating the prices. Uh, well, I think these are some of the highlights of his own manifesto. So interestingly, I see a mention in the private sector here. Does that enthuse you? Yes, it's, it's, it's interesting, really. And, and we, while we welcome that, you know, there has been a confusion, really, that we must clear. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes when they call the private sector, then you wonder what exactly are they referring to as private sector? You know, there is an institution that is called the private sector, and this con consists of MAN, that's Manufacturer Association of Nigeria, consists of NECA, Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, consists of NASIMA, we have NASME, and we have NASI. Those five organizations, you have, these are the rules we can play. And we can fly, we can flag all those success stories, that this is what we have done, the UPS have done in these days, and these are the effects for those days. We are still open for engagement, and those engagements, as I said, will continue even to the future. I'm looking at the fact that, you know, I mean, I highlighted the fact that you are 
um, an employers consultative association. Yep. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the areas where we know that, you know, we seem to be facing some danger right now is uh, with this immigration, this Jackba syndrome. Um, how is it affecting your association and what are employers saying? Well, depending on the perspective from which you are looking at it. You know, someone will say, we are exporting talents. You know, somebody, will, somebody will look at it from the perspective of um, returns, that the talents you have exported, they will, they will, um, they will, they will send uh, returns back to the country within the context of, um, of, of, of Forex. But for the business context, you know, businesses need talents to survive, notwithstanding the automation that is coming up, the role of ICT now. But businesses need talent to survive. So for any business that says it doesn't need talent or the current Japa syndrome is not, um, not a cause of worry, it's, it's probably lying. So it affects businesses um, significantly. And that has also made employers to be a bit creative and put more focus within the context of talent development. So you have many businesses now having structures that have to do with that runs their talent pipelines so that you have a group of employees that you have trained, that you are bringing up deliberately now, so that when some leave, people will always leave. Mobility of labor is, is global, is legal, is allowable. So when people leave, you have a pipeline of others, competent, that can fill in those gaps. And it's not peculiar to, peculiar to, to Nigeria. Indian is also a big exporter of talent and is working for them now. If you check the the top 50 companies in the world, probably in Indian, India, Indians are, are, are running, are running three quarter of those companies. It has its positives, but within the context of development, you know, sometimes you worry about it, especially when you are in a developing stage. You need all the talents that you can get, all the talents that you can muster for them, for them to run. The, 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 the flip side of it, positive side, is, is as things continue to improve within the context of this environment, it is also possible that those that have left they probably will come back. They have learned new technologies. They have That's learned... a probability. Yes, we can, probably, yes. We can probably come back. That, we? Yeah, we come back on that. But it's a, it's a probability that you can, you, can, um, you, can, you can tie some level of hope on that is possible once things start to improve in this environment. You know, that they probably come back. You know, let's ask ourselves, Chris, why will I leave Nigeria to go and work in Europe? Two major reasons. Well, before, probably economic reasons and probably security reasons. So if you deal with the economic reasons in this environment, that I have jobs I can do, I have well-paying jobs, decent jobs that I can do, and the environment is safe, is secure, then the propensity for me to want to leave is less because I have every other thing that makes me to want to leave. I have them probably around here. Hmm. Because, I mean, looking at the entire thing, you know, I was just going to ask you, shouldn't we have a strategy as opposed to hoping that these things will happen because many of the state governors and governments appear as surprised, as disappointed as regular people, whereas they should be the ones formulating the policies to ensure that these things don't happen. So for what you see, how far away or close do you think we are to stemming this tide? Um, well, I must tell you we're, 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 we're a bit far. You know, I, I will, um, the statement I started with, I will, I will reiterate it the third time. You know, we can't continue to complain about the effect and feeding the cause. You know, we keep feeding the causes why we are at this point. You know, even up to today, some state governors are not, um, are not paying the 30,000 minimum wage. Um, some state governments are not creative enough to, to come up with new um, alternative sources of generating income. They are all, everybody is going to Abuja at the end of the month. It is not sustainable. It makes, it creates a system, it creates a rent-seeking culture where we start dishing out benefits, we start dishing out, um, you know, it's, and it's, it's, it's worrisome because we all travel out of the country once in a while, we see how things are run, then why we come back and we can't implement those basic things, you know, it's, it's still worrisome. And those things are not rocket science, basically. They are things that a focused, determined person in government 
can do. Let's wind down from where we started about the economy, yeah. the essence, the importance of uh, those who are seeking to lead this country for the next four years, yeah. and perhaps at every level, uh, not just the uh, number one seat, yeah. to ensure that they get it right with the economy. Yeah. Now, for those who will be voting, uh, even some of your members, if I could add that, yeah. uh, they are usually accused of not even coming out to vote in the first place. And so after talking all the talk, they don't walk the talk. Yeah. So um, do you think that uh, we should be optimistic that this time we will have this message resonates with those who are going out there to get their voices heard or make their votes count? We can only hope, Chris. You know, the level of awareness now the level of awareness of the of the wrath, let me, let me permit me to use the word, the wrath in which we find ourselves, that the level of awareness, you know, the understanding of the risk that we face, I think is, is wider now. So that should ordinarily ordinary stir an average Nigerian to want to do the needful and make sure that he casts his vote when the, when, when the time comes. As I said we can, we can only hope that Nigerians have learned enough, enough to know or to see that enough is actually enough. Yeah. Are you worried about the level of engagement that you're getting? Uh, I don't know whether your association is partnering or it has invited the candidates to engage with it, um, you know, on, on roundtable discussions to, you know, to scrutinize what their plans are. I mean, to also have feelers from your people um, on what it is. Are you worried about the level of engagement or you're enthusiastic about it? For, for the OPS, the organized private sector, as it were, and the institution, and what we have done is not to join the bandwagon of inviting them to a public gathering, as some have done, because we've realized it's all about rhetorics, it's all about playing to the gallery, and we've, we've, we, are, we are working on a, a more strategic engagement, a more right. strategic private engagement on these are the concerns of the organized businesses. How exactly are you going to deal with this? Now, the, the response we want to believe um, will, be, will be positive, has been positive. All right. And we also want to believe that progressively the message mm -hmm. we, keep, we keep sinking. Now, as someone mentioned um, the last time, I, I, I think um, the former CBN governor mentioned that whoever is coming in now, if he doesn't have a definitive roadmap, because we know the problems, there's going to be huge problems, huge challenges. If it doesn't have a definitive roadmap, then it should probably not be voted in. Fine place to let it go. Uh, Mr. Adewale Oyerinde is the Director General, Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA. Thank you for coming on today. Our pleasure. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. We're back in a moment. Stay with us.